Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There is great revelation in the biblical account of the flood. Now, many people, they scoff at the idea that a great flood took place and destroyed all human flesh except for one family. But when we look at the scripture, we see that this event is testified not just in one place, but in several places, both in the Old Covenant and also in the New Covenant. For example, Yeshua himself spoke about the days of Noah and the flood that took place. So, you know, you need to be honest with yourselves. You can't accept just some of this book and reject others. You can't say, as some people have told me, well, those words in red are really what I pay attention to because in my Bible, those words in red are Yeshua's or Jesus' words. And many people put them as a higher source of revelation. Well, I don't recommend that. All Scripture is profitable. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable to bring about change in the man of God that he might be complete for every good work. And of course, man means, as we learn in the book of Genesis, both male and female. So don't... Uh, elevate one scripture or one part of the Bible above others. But my message is this, that Yeshua himself spoke about the literalness of the flood. And you will not be prepared for the last days. You won't have a proper perspective of what's going to take place in the future if you do not understand the historical accuracy of this book in regard to all things including a great flood now let me say something else as science matures it's catching up to the scripture i've said that previously and there is more and more scientists not necessarily those that believe in god but but more and more are seeing evidence in the account what they see revealed through geology, the account, the record that is found in the earth. They're finding evidence that there was a great flood. And we know, biblically speaking, that there was. So take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Genesis and chapter 6. The book of Genesis and chapter 6. Now, we saw last week that there is a turn of the Bible's attention to one man. And that man is Noah or Noah. And we find that he found favor with God. And what did this favor that he found with God brought about in his life? Revelation. God revealed truth to Noah. So one of the greatest outcomes of favor, and Noah, he lived differently. He did what was right. He did not do what his flesh told him to do, but he made moral judgments, ethical judgments, based upon his relationship with other people. And because of that, God began to move in his life and God gave him revelation you know what we are in such need of is revelation and that's why we put such a, a strong strong emphasis upon scripture God's perfect revelation to us 
Now, when we look in Genesis 6, notice what God says in verse 13 to Noah. Verse 13. And God spoke to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. Now, that phrase is, is very, very uh, full of theological teaching. Notice the word flesh. That word flesh has to do with human beings, but also in the scripture. As we grow in our understanding of biblical vocabulary and how words ought to be understood, flesh is synonymous with sin. Flesh is synonymous with a carnal, a sinful nature of one doing what is right in his eyes, doing what is desirable to the body and not to God. Secondly, when we look at this, it says, for the end of all flesh. Don't think that you're going to escape things. Don't think that you somehow are going to be an exception to the rule. God says there is coming in this scripture an end to all flesh. Now, when we rightly understand what we talked about last week and what we're going to see this week, there is a connection between this flood that he's going to utilize to bring about the end of all flesh. There's a connection between the flood and judgment. So here's an important thing that we realize. God, who is loving, who is merciful, who is slow to anger and abounding in grace, who forgives, who has mercy, God nevertheless also will judge. Now, if you were to ask me, what is the best example? What best declares to us that God will judge? And the answer is this, the cross. We learn in the new covenant that the sins of humanity, that's what 1 John chapter 2 tells us, that the sins of the world were placed upon Messiah. Who's Messiah? God the Father's only begotten Son, whom he was well pleased, whom he loved. But because Messiah became sin for us, meaning he took on our sins for a very important outcome, that he might take the judgment, the wrath of God, so we would not, that we could escape. He became the provision. And let me share with you, as we look at the second half of chapter 6 of Genesis, one of the key thoughts that is intrinsically found in this text is God's provision. And if we do not respond properly, obediently to God's provision, well, we're going to see that we come to an eternal end. Not one that is overdone with no more, but an eternal end. And what is that end connected to? The wrath of God. So one who rejects God's provision will experience God's eternal wrath. Now, those should be very sobering words. But that's what the word of God reveals. Look again. And God spoke to Noah. The end of all flesh has come before me. God is long suffering. He is patient. But eventually, given time, given the multiplicity of sins, it will reach up to him where he must respond. His holiness, his character, his righteousness demands it. Now, what do we find? Well, we see in the second half of verse 13, for the earth was full of Hamas. Now, Hamas represents not just a behavior, but also a mindset, or better yet, a condition of man. Now, I don't know how it's translated in your Bible, but how I would translate the word Hamas is the word violence. But violence for the sake of violence. 
I believe we've talked about it in a previous study, but let me just quickly repeat. Hamas is violence because you want to inflict pain, suffering, sorrow, and, and even death upon an individual, another. That there is a delight, a joy, a contentment that comes from seeing others suffer. See, Hamas is the character of Satan. That's what moves him. And that, which, that is what also will bring about his eternal destruction and those who will walk according to his will. And let me just simply say to you, if you don't choose wisely, if you do not choose God's ways, his purposes, his plans, you know, we have things, you know, we all deal with computers and there's that default mode. Well, if you don't choose God's way, God's provision through the gospel, through Messiah Yeshua, by default, just naturally, you don't have to do anything. You will be choosing Satan's plan, his pathway, and you will reap what he reaps. So it's a very, very important lesson that we're learning. God is revealing principles, life principles, kingdom principles in this sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. So once again, second half of verse 13, for the earth is full of Hamas from before you all, meaning it came because of you is how it should be translated. And behold, God is still speaking, and behold, I am destroying them. Now, the them is humanity. He is going to destroy. That is God. God is bringing it about. He is responsible for this destruction. It's all an outcome of his doing through his judgment because he is a holy God, a righteous God. And therefore, this God must eventually deal with sin, judge it, and destroy it. So he says, Behold, Hineni, behold, I am destroying them with the earth. And that simply is because there is, in how we were created, a connection between man, Adam, and ground, Adama, which is a, a reference to the earth. So there's a connection. See, here's the problem. When we have more of a connection with the substance by which we were created rather than with the one who created us. You are either going to be connected to one or the other, the substance of your creation or the one who made you. That's the point. So God is bringing a destruction upon humanity and earth. Verse 14. Now, because, and this is, is huge, because Noah found favor with God. He became a recipient of something. And what was that? Well, look at verse 14. God is speaking to him. And he says, make a say lacha, make for yourselves. Now, that's important. Now, many Bibles just say, you make, but we can understand it. And I believe we ought to understand it as make for yourself. This revelation comes to us for what's in our best interests. God wants to bless us. So favor, finding the favor of God, what does it bring about first and foremost? Revelation in your life. And that favor will never amount to anything long term. It won't lead to blessings unless you understand the revelation of God's favor being a recipient of his word, his illumination, his instruction to us. So he says, verse 14, make for yourself, and the word here is teva, an ark, a ark of gopher wood. So wood is also significant because the ark, undeniably, God provides it. Now, Noah is going to build it, but this ark is an outcome of revelation. God is going to instruct him. 
God is going to all the way assist Noah. And in this working and responding to God's revelation, well, you know what? Noah's going to get to know God better. So serving God is not for God's benefit. It's for our benefit that we might come to recognize, learn more, understand the truth about God. So make for yourself this ark of gopher wood, and the next word is kinim. Now, kinim with a kuf and not a kaf. If you know Hebrew, you know the significance of those two letters in that word that sounds the same. Kinim here is the word for nest, like a bird will make a nest. And a nest is significant because usually the nest is for the purpose of laying eggs, meaning a rabbi, a sage of Judaism, would always associate a nest with eggs and therefore the next generation. Let me simplify that. There is a connection between nest and future. So what do we glean from this? Well, we glean this. God's provision is so that we can have future, a future with him in his kingdom. There are numerous kingdom principles that we're seeing in Genesis chapter 6. So make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and it should have nest in it. Now, perhaps your Bible might say rooms or chambers or, or however it may be translated, but it literally is the word for nest, as in a bird's nest, but it's here has to do with a place for habitation so that there's a future. He says, you shall make the ark, and here's what's key. You make it from wood, but then he says, you shall cover it. And, and pay attention to that word because it's the same word that we get the phrase atonement as in the day of atonement. Kaf, fe, resh. So he says, you are to cover up all of this ark from inside and outside. And notice how it continues. Inside and outside with kofer, that is, a covering. Now, this word for atonement, it can also be understood as the word ransom, as in something that is paid to, to bring about a release, to bring about a, a renewal of a relationship where two were, were, were separated, now they're going to be reunited. So here again, only in Hebrew do we see these things coming about? In English, I think one of the ways that the King James translates it is pitch. Others, maybe more modern translation says tar. But here's the key. Without this covering, without this substance, without this ransom being paid, guess what? What's going to happen to that ark? Well, without this covering, it is going to sink. Water is going to get in. Now, water here, for our context, we're going to see in the weeks to come that the water was synonymous with God's judgment. Remember the scripture says that God's not going to destroy the world again, but be careful. He says, I'm not going to destroy the world again with water. So water was a source of destruction. In the last days, he's going to destroy the world with fire. That's what the word of God reveals. But without this covering, what would happen? The, those inside of the ark and the ark itself would not survive God's judgment. So what's the message? Without atonement, without ransom being paid, we cannot uh, utilize God's provision. See, Messiah came into the world, but if we don't receive it, if we don't utilize Messiah, receive him into our life, understand the ransom that he paid, well, if we don't accept that, we're going to be consumed by the judgment, the wrath of God. Move on now to verse 15. And this 
And I would say the next phrase would be like it's a share, which is which or who or that. But in this case, is it's more like how. This is how you shall make it, referring to the ark. It should be 300 cubits in its, its length. It should be 50 cubits in its width. And it should be 30 cubits in its height. Now, these numbers have significance. 300, whether we have 3 or 300 or 3,000, the number 3 has to do with uh, revealing, declaring something. The number three is a word of manifestation of, of information. So 300, we're talking about three times 100. 100 or 10 or 1,000 or 10,000 has to do with completeness. So we're seeing here great revelation. God wants to completely reveal something to us. And it all has to do with the ark. Now, the ark is going to be a means of revelation. We're going to see in the upcoming weeks, I mean, when Noah is building it, people want to know what he's doing, why he's doing it. So the ark becomes a means of a proclamation. Secondly, we find 50. 50 is the number of jubilee. It has to do with freedom. It has to do with liberty. And the number 30, as in the 30, as in 30 cubics, is its height. 30 oftentimes has to do with death. Why do I say that? Those 30 pieces of silver. In the scripture that was given for, to Judas for betraying Messiah to death. Secondly, 30 in the scripture, we see this in the book of Numbers, for example, is synonymous with mourning, that is, a response to death. So put this together. The ark is God's revelation of how we can have liberty, freedom, over what? Death. If you reject the revelation and the provision of God's ark, and you don't understand what it's for, the outcome is going to be death. So, Abraham, or excuse me, Noah is told to make it 30, 300 cubics is its length, 50 cubics is the ark's width, and 30 cubics is its height. Verse 16, Zohar. Now, that's the first word, and it comes, perhaps in your Bible, it's translated a window, because we're going to find it's, it's up above. Many would say it's a skylight. That's a fine translation as well. But it comes from the word for noontime. And what's unique, why is 12 o'clock, when the sun is at the highest, why is it called Soharayim? Well, it's plural. It's that same word in the plural, meaning an abundance of shining or light. Now, here's what we should glean. When all of these individuals, who we're going to see in a few minutes, enter into the ark, that is Noah, his sons, his wife, and his son's wives, what his son's wives, you're going to find that they come in and they begin to experience the outcome of God's judgment. That rain begins to fall, fall that that ark is going to be tossed, it's going to begin moving. And the only thing that they have is if they look up, they're going to see what? The heavens. Now, the heavens declare the glory of God. You see, the wrath that they're experiencing, but they're being preserved because of God's revelation, because of God's provision. All of that is the outcome of God's glory. His preservation of his people, his deliverance, his salvation is all connected to his glory. That's why those who have been saved, those who have received that provision, those who have been ransomed from sin, they should live a life that glorifies God. This is what this passage is trying to, to share with us. So look again, verse 16. There is a skylight, a window. You should make it for the ark. And it should, it says literally, ve, ve el ama. Ama is a cubic. It should be, its completion should be a cubic. And it should be mi limala, which means is 
up above what we would say in the roof. And you should also make, it says, and a door of the ark in its side for entering in and eventually coming out. And you shall make tachtit, that would be the bottom floor, and, and shnaim, which would be the second floor, and shlishim, uh, which would be the third floor. You should make it. And now verse 17. And here again, I think it's very significant that there are three floors to the ark, the ark provision. This whole account is trying to manifest, to reveal, to declare, to document God as a God who provides for our life, for us to overcome his judgment and the consequence of sin. Verse, verse 17. And I, that is God still speaking, behold, I am brain ha mabul mine. Now, the flood of water. Now, we need to learn two Hebrew words at this time. The word flood, we only have one word in English for flood. Hebrew has two words. Shitaphon, which is a flood. But this is like if you have uh, uh, a dam and the dam breaks and water comes rushing and it just destroys everything in its path. People can be in a home and that power of that water rushing by just brings about death in an instant, destruction in a moment. Then it's over. Well, the mabul is very, very different. Mabul is the word here for flood in the book of Genesis. Not shitaphon, but mabul. The flood is when water begins to rise up so slowly. Now, think about what would happen. If you are in the lowland and that water began to rise, you'd move to higher land. And eventually, as the water gets higher, you'd move to higher land. And as that water gets higher yet, you would want to move to higher and higher land. But eventually, <laughs> all humanity, they would be going towards the higher land. And eventually, <laughs> there's not enough space. And what would that do? Well, people would begin to fight for their life. So the flood being a mabul instead of a shitaphon, it is much more fearful. It brings about chaos. It brings about uh, conflict and violence and, and unkind speech and desperation and, and great sadness as perhaps one would see their loved one be, be submerged. Their children, their, their, their uh, uh, possessions, all these things that the flesh loves, it's just slowly destroyed. So that's what we find God revealing about this flood. Look again, verse 17. And behold, I'm bringing a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy, here it is, kol basar, all flesh. Don't be foolish, thinking as we said, maybe I'll escape. Maybe it won't touch me. Maybe I'll be that one person and get on high enough land. No, God's flood is going to submerge all things. And it's not just going to be here today and gone tomorrow. No, it took a long time for those floodwaters to finally uh, recede. One couldn't survive it. Only through God's provision can one survive his judgment. So behold, I am bringing a flood of water upon the earth to destroy. Here's the purpose. God wants to destroy all flesh which is in it. Spirit of life, meaning all the spirit of life underneath the heavens and all which is in the earth, yigva, they will, and the word here, perhaps expire, but it has to do with death, but a, a wane death, meaning one that uh, takes time. So the language here is not pleasant. It is one that should, should elicit in our minds fear. You know, if you were to tell me, Brooke, you're going to go to bed tonight, you're going to fall asleep, but you're never going to wake up. 
That would not bother me one bit. But if I was told you are going to have some disease and it is going to be a slow, torturous death, well, I wouldn't sleep good after hearing that news. Now, I know what my future holds. I have victory because of Messiah. I'm going to overcome that through my death. But, but it wouldn't be something that would be easy to, to deal with. Well, this is not something. What he's saying is God's judgment is not something easy to deal with. And these foolish people that say, well, I believe when I'm dead, I'm just dead, it's over with. No, it's not. You see, when you think only about the flesh, the flesh will be destroyed. And the flesh might be destroyed in a moment in your situation. You might die in your sleep. You might get hit by a car and like that be dead. Your heart might just stop in a second. But the soul is indestructible. See, what we find here is that the soul is eternal. There's eternal life, but there's also, read sometime the book of Daniel chapter 12. Everyone's going to be resurrected, some to everlasting life and others to everlasting shame and contempt. And also, the implication is judgment or torment. So these are serious words. What's being revealed here through that last ver word of verse 18 is significant. But notice God still comes back to his promise. We see judgment and also revelation. Judgment and revelation. What's the revelation here? God's provision. And notice what he says, verse 18. And I will establish my covenant with you. Now, who's you? It's Noah who received revelation. You can't have a covenant being established without revelation. And here's the important thing. This covenant, well, it's an agreement, but hopefully we've learned that, that the word covenant, it is an agreement with a purpose. And what's that purpose? To preserve relationships. So God's covenant, it wants to preserve a relationship between his people and himself. And also, within that covenant contains the promises and the blessings of God. So there's a connection between provision and covenant. God says, look again at verse 18, And I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come to the ark. Now, what is the language here teaching us? Well, there's only one response in order that that covenant would be established in the life of Noah and others. And that is, if they respond to the revelation that God's making a covenant, that covenant involves a provision, a provision for the judgment of God, not to be consumed by it. But they have to respond. And notice there's only one provision. There's not a multiplicity of ways. God didn't say, you know what? Here's an ark. Here's a spaceship. Here's this. Here's that. Choose for yourself. You know, you come from one culture. Here's a provision for you. You come from another culture. Here's one from you. You're of this race. Well, here's a provision for you. You're of this ethnicity, here's one for you. doesn't work that way, does it? God provides one way and only one way. And that's why that verse of scripture from the book of Acts chapter 4 verse 12, I mean, if you don't know it, you ought to, where it says that there's only one name under the heavens which is given to man, here again, male and female, by which we must be saved. And what's that name? Yeshua. One way. Now, you can call that name in a multiplicity of languages. Whether you say Yeshua, Hebrew. Whether you say Jesus in Spanish. Whether you say Iesus in Greek. Jesus in English. Whatever it may be, that's totally acceptable. 
God understands languages. He's the one who confused that one language and made all the other. He understands the confessions of the heart, not just the words, but the true confessions of a heart. And unless you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart concerning his provision, and how did he manifest his provision? Well, not just on the cross. Many people have died on the cross, but also through the resurrection. So if you don't believe in the resurrection, you are without hope. You have rejected God's provision. So it says, verse 18, I'm establishing my covenant with you, and you shall come to the ark. Notice, a response. Now, in the same way, and, and what's so important is this. As I said at the beginning of our study, Yeshua spoke about the reality of Noah, Noah's age and the people who made up his age, and the reality of a flood. And all of this is a paradigm. If you doubt that, just read 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 18 through verse 22. You're going to see, undeniably, the new covenant shouts this out, that there is an inherent relationship between the teaching and the historical revelation of the flood and what we need to know about God's provision of His only begotten Son, Messiah Yeshua, for salvation, that we might overcome God's judgment and experience deliverance. Let's say that another way, experience salvation. So literally, if we take this right, I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come to the ark. Now, the paradigm is this. Did everyone respond? No, they did not. Did many people get revelation? Yes, they did. Did some not? Obviously, some might not hear about, about Noah, but they still get what they deserved. But what a blessing, a potential blessing to be around Noah, to hear his account, to see what he was doing, how his life reflected what he was teaching, what he believed in his heart. It manifests itself over a long period, traditionally 120 years that he built the ark. Here again, that's tradition. But it would have taken a long time for one man to build that ark. So you have to respond. That's the message. Those who didn't respond, well, they weren't delivered. He says, you and your sons and your wife and your wives of your sons with you. Now, something stands out. If I was writing this, I would say, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives with you but it's very significant that instead of going which would be the perceived order it goes from noah to his sons that stands out and we're speaking about the next generation and that's why there's always a relationship between salvation god's deliverance his kingdom and that next generation here, sons is spoken of because son has to do with inheritance. It's only when we take hold of God's provision against his judgment are we also taking hold of that same provision so that we can receive the inheritance that God wants to give to us. And it's only through that covenant relationship. Remember the purpose of the covenant? Maintaining that relationship. So the outcome, the promises, the blessings of that covenant can be realized, can be experienced. So once again, you and your sons and your wife and the wives of your sons with you. Verse 19. And for all that's alive and for all flesh, he says, two, meaning a pair. So from all life, from everything that has flesh, to from all, that they, you shall bring to the ark for life. So this is the instruction to bring two of all types of animals to the ark that they might live. And what type? Well, it says male and female they shall be. Now, why male and female? 
Well, notice God's order. And here again, just don't think that, that because people doubt the historicalness of this account, that that's how they attack this, this account. No. Notice that it's Noah and his wife his sons and their wives, and the animals, both male and female. Now, what we're seeing is a God-sanctioned union. Don't say male and male and female and female. That is an abomination before God. It is a violation of God's order. It does not reflect the, the life that God wants us to. To, to demonstrate. See, he's building this up by couples and pairs of animal, male and female, for the future. This is a paradigm. Yeshua spoke about the days of Noah. In the last days, there being a similarity. And these last days would give away to what? Well, not to a repopulating of the earth, but the entrance into the kingdom. So anyone who thinks, well, this union between a man and a man and a woman and a woman, that's okay. And this confusion today of male and female, you know, people are talking about genderless. Well, that's just ridiculous. You're born, you're born, male or female. Now, as an outcome of sin, and I need to be very careful, listen to what I'm saying, don't make conclusions that I don't, I don't offer to you. And that is this, because of sin, that original sin, we have all types of diseases. There is imperfection in this world. So does that mean sometimes a person is born and, and they have uh, problems, health, or, or other deformities or other things? Obviously. But in a general sense, male and female. And we don't see any basis for people choosing gender god chooses gender not individual and all of these things are an attack against a kingdom order and that's what this book is speaking to an order that god wants an order that humanity can continue now we're going to realize in the upcoming weeks that noah although he finds favor Although he was a, a righteous man in his generation, that is, in his generation standards, he was not what? He was not perfect. He's going to demonstrate sin in a few weeks. So this is not a perfect representation of salvation, but we see principles in this section for learning about salvation. God is slowly but progressing his revelation to us so that we can understand more completely, more perfectly what he's about. Well, look again, verse, verse 20. Not only from all these types of animals, but he says also from the birds according to its kind and according to the beasts according to its kind and from everything that creeps upon the ground according to its kind, to from all you should bring unto you, or really that they shall come unto you. Now this shows God's uh, power, his providence, his authority. He says, all of these, yavo, they will come unto you for life. Now this is important because what the scripture is saying here is that these animals, they are going to respond for life. There has to be a response for life. And we see how God is under total, total control of this event. His sovereignty, his order is being established. He's bringing it together as the basis for a new populating of the earth, for a new or continuation of life. But here again, we're going to learn it falls short. But don't forget the principles. Don't ignore what God's revealing here. Verse 21. And you shall take for yourself from every kind of food, literally, mikol malacha, from every food which 
it is eaten. So not only is, is Noah braining, braining the animals or seeing the animals come unto him, he's also responsible for bringing food, that is placing the food inside the ark and gathering it unto you, and it shall be to you and for them for food. Now, this is after the fall. After the fall, animals would eat one another. But in God's provision, in the state of his order, under his authority, under his sovereignty, in the ark, what do we see? We see a garden experience being reestablished for as long as they were in that ark. Now, here's the key. When we are in God's provision, that is, when we are in Messiah, and doesn't, for example, Paul, he speaks so frequently in the epistles. I mean, an emphasis is in him, in him, meaning in Messiah, in Yeshua. When we're in Messiah, we should be experiencing, demonstrating, living according to garden truth. Now, what's the garden? Well, there is an inherent relationship, just look at the book of Revelation at the end, between the kingdom and the garden. So when we're in him, we're going to live according to kingdom principles. When the animals were in God's provision, they didn't eat one another. They ate every type of, of vegetation. That's what it says here in this passage of Scripture. Verse 22. And Noah did according to all. Now, Noah, he was a man of faith. And how was this one who found favor, this one who was a recipient of God's revelation, what did he do? Well, look at it again, verse 22. And Noah did according to all which commanded him God. Thus he did. Or yes, it's the word Ken. Yes, he did. Now, let me conclude this uh, session by saying, wouldn't you like there to be a sentence that summarized your life, that all which God commanded you to do, thus, yes, you did it. That's what we should be striving for. So, Messiah this wonderful provision of God's only begotten Son who took upon himself the judgment of the world. When we're in him, we need to be living according to the kingdom. In fact, when we are in him, we can't help but living according to kingdom principle. We are going to say yes to everything that God commands. See, here's the problem I have. Many people, many Bible teachers will, will take this section, the account of Noah, the ark, and see great significance in that for helping us to understand it's a salvation paradigm. That's true. But you just can't take pieces of it. We need to see that all of it is part of that salvation paradigm. This, this, this description of what salvation should lead in a person's life. And what does salvation lead us to do? Obey God. So Noah, he was not saved because of his obedience, but because of his faith in God, he obeyed and he became an instrument, a catalyst of the salvation of others. Now, how many people were saved? Well, we know from the end of chapter 5, Noah had those three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yephet. So there was Noah and his three sons, that's four. Noah had a wife, and we learn today that so did each of these three sons. How many? Well, as Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, when he is using the same account as a means of helping us understand Yeshua, he talks about 
eight individuals. Eight is the number of redemption. These eight people that escaped God's judgment, they did so because of this typology of redemption, this ransom, this provision of God's ark in order that what? That they could overcome the judgment. See, this is what Messiah did. Messiah received the full measure of God's judgment upon that cross. What's the outcome of God's judgment? Death. But Messiah overcame death. And we, when we are in Him, when we identify with Him as our Lord, our Savior, then we are going to have a likeness of His life. What does the Scripture say? Our life is hidden. But when Messiah appears at the end of the age, so were all life being manifested because of this intimacy, this oneness that we have because we're in him. So let me conclude by saying this. This book of Genesis lays the foundation for us being able to understand greater this progressive revelation of God's word. The truth is always there. But through progressive revelation, we understand God's truth better. And what's the purpose? So that all that he reveals to us, all that he commands us, yes, we will do it. Well, I'll close with that until next week, and we enter into Genesis and chapter 7. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.